Hey, what's up, guys? John here. I'm Austin Rutherford on the podcast. He's got a pretty big following on TikTok, about eight, nine hundred thousand followers over there. He's educating people on real estate investing, and uh, you know how to make money in you know the real estate business if you're starting out with very little to no money. And uh, he brings a really unique perspective. He has a twenty million dollar real estate portfolio based out of Ohio. Now lives in South Florida, so he's popping back and forth between Florida and Ohio, closing deals. And uh, yeah, I think I'm really going to enjoy this show. And he talks also a lot about online opportunities, how to make money online. So yeah, if you're interested in real estate, you're interested in making money, then you'll love this podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? John here. I have Austin Rutherford on the show today. He's absolutely crushing it on TikTok, posting a lot of valuable content around house flipping and real estate investing. And he's navigating the market really, really well. I'm really looking forward to uh, having an open conversation about what's really going on in the housing market, where he sees the biggest opportunities. He's now in uh, South Florida, but he's doing a lot of investing in Ohio. Ohio. So, uh, Austin, welcome to the show, man. Man, I'm looking forward to this, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Definitely, definitely. For sure. So, you came to uh, South Florida a couple years ago. Yeah, about two years ago. Uh, my fiance at the time and I ended up moving down here. Just got married like two months ago, but living here full time and investing uh, in Ohio still. Oh, cool. What type of, uh, before we even dive into that, like how did you get started in, in real estate? And when did you kind of buy your first deal? How'd that work out? Yeah, so the original dream was to go to the NBA. That, that was the that was the dream back in the day. So I graduated high school, went to Arizona to play basketball for a year out of prep school, not at actual Arizona. Um, I started hating basketball and then started reading books, thinking grow rich. That's what turned me on to real estate. Uh, really the idea of passive residual income, you yeah. know, making money continuously without working. It sounded pretty good. Um, so I ended up buying a duplex uh, when I was 20 years old um, and flipped my first house at 22, uh, made 100 grand in profit, reinvested it all, and I've been doing it for the last eight or nine years. Cool. So that duplex, did you kind of house hack it? Uh, so I didn't even know what house hacking was, nor did I know what wholesaling was. All I knew was flipping houses. Yeah. Uh, but I, I wish I would have known what house hacking was. I had to put 20% down on it. So uh, b- big difference for sure. Yeah. And so that house flip, what did that house flip look like? Yeah. So it was uh, I was sending out uh, direct mail to probates. Five letters, five months in a row. On the fifth letter, they called me back. Um, ended up buying it for seventy four thousand dollars. These are Ohio, these are yeah. Ohio prices. <laughs> uh, seventy four thousand dollar purchase, um, one hundred and seventy thousand dollar construction. So we put on a six hundred square foot addition, put twenty some thousand dollars into the foundation, uh, plumbing, electric, HVAC, roof, windows, like a full gut, everything. Um, so I was all in for about a quarter mil, and then sold it for three hundred seventy five thousand. And nice. uh, I netted, and I walked with one hundred and seven thousand in profit. So it was a great first deal. What did that? What did you do with the 107? Yeah, I literally I paid off my debts, so I invested into a program, put it all on a, a credit card, so a coaching program to to learn the game. So I paid that off, and then I put it all back into marketing and growing the business. I didn't go on a trip. I didn't buy a pair of sneakers. I didn't go out to dinner. I didn't buy a car. I didn't do it. I actually went back to work and went back to college after I walked away with the hundred thousand dollar check. That's respectable because a lot of people <laughs> are like hundred thousand bucks. I'm gonna upgrade the apartment. I'm gonna get this new car for lease, sure. and before you know it, they're back to square one in yes, a year. It's just like having the bigger vision, right? You yeah. know, one, one check's not gonna change anybody's life. Like a hundred grand is great today, but it doesn't do anything for you long term. So it's always you know keeping that bigger vision in mind and not having to restart from zero once you you know you're able to do that first deal. So what did the next deal look like? Yeah, so a couple months later, it was like 60 or 90 days. Um, I forget the exact numbers, but I ended up making about $40,000 in profit. Sold it for like 250 ish So again, you know, smaller deal. Uh, made like 40 k ish So I had about 150000 in profit in total in about a five to six month period. And uh, I went back to my mom. I, I grew up, you know, go to college, get a degree, get a job, you know, work your way up. And I went back to my mom. I was like, I'm never going to graduate, mom. I'm dropping yeah. out. <laughs> and yeah. she was like, I, I respect that. Yeah. And uh, quit valet job and then went all in on real estate after that. That's cool. And so that was like, what, 2013? Around uh, there? 20, 2013, 2014. Yeah. I sold, I don't know, it was four days after my 22nd birthday when I sold that house. I, th- I think it was 2015. Oh, cool. And then so like around that time, were you trying to buy multiple deals or were you just focused still on like one deal at a time? Yeah, so like I said, I kind of got into the game and I was taught flipping houses using other people's money. So that first deal was a quarter million dollars I raised from somebody for private money. Um, that's all I knew. I didn't know about wholesaling, no idea what it was. Yeah. Um, I knew about rentals, but I really didn't understand like the Burr method and all that other stuff. Um, so all I really knew was flipping houses using other people's money. So that's what I did you know, for a long time. Uh, flipped a bunch of houses, bought a couple rentals along the way. Um, and then you know, a few years into the business, uh, after doing some new construction, some flips, then kind of inverted the business. Instead of doing all flips and some rentals, we're basically doing all rentals and some flips. So at the beginning, it was just flipping houses. What was the major like transition? Was it because of your you were paying forty percent tax and you're doing all this work to get this small little uh, blip and pay, and yep. then 
you know, the rental would kind of spit out cash all the time? Yeah. So funny story. This is like one of those like things in life where you can see your life change like right in front of your eyes. Yeah. Um, one was the tax bill. Yeah. I hated paying taxes, but I didn't know, I didn't know how to not pay taxes. Right. I, I was ignorant to the fact. And I had a buddy, him and I started real estate at about the same time. And when he started, he was doing all uh, rental property, not all, but the majority, all rental properties. And I was, when I started, I was doing the majority all flips, right? So kind of two different business models. And at the beginning, I had a lot more money than he did. You yeah. know, I was traveling more. I was, I was enjoying life a little bit more, right? And a few years into it, I, very good friend. He was a, one of, uh, one of the, uh, the, the groomsmen of my wedding. And uh, I was on the phone. I was like, yo, bro, like, how's business? And he was like, man... I just refied a portfolio. I was like, what's it look like? And I forget the exact numbers, but it was like, yeah, you know, I just refied 30 houses that he owned. He refinanced them. He paid off 10 of them. He re-leveraged the other 20 and pulled a million dollars tax-free off the top. I was like, come again? Yeah. And he said it again. I was like, all right. The next day I went in, I told my team, I said, everything's a rental property. Yeah. So that was kind of like the, the changing, you know, point in my life. Yeah. So, so he's doing mainly single fam or is that what you're doing also? Yeah, so the the majority single family. I got a couple of smaller complexes, six units, eight units. Um, same for him. He had a, a twenty or forty at one point, but vast majority single families. Um, so I mean, I'd buy the bigger deals. You know, I just I know the single family right now. Yeah. Um, but you know, looking for some bigger stuff as well. So what do you think is? Uh, it's interesting. Like some people are so gung ho on single family. Some are really like, oh, I love two to four units, and others are like, oh, I love uh, bigger deals. Yeah. And you know, a lot of them have their own benefits. Like with a single family, obviously you're a uh, you're probably going to get a longer term tenant. Potentially, somebody's going to take care of the property more. Um, you might be able to get a better exit on, you know, selling these individuals. Yeah. Um, but the two to four units, you know, you can still get residential debt. For sure. Like there's benefits, but then the commercial properties, you know, obviously economies of scale. Yeah. But like, what do you love about single families compared to the other? Yeah. So I I, I would buy the bigger stuff. You know, I just I didn't know it previously. We're actively looking at it now. Um, you know, some part of it was you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. You know, scared to go bigger, right? More higher reward, higher risk. Um, but what I like about it, you usually get a tenant that stays longer. You know, they treat it as an actual home. You know, they'll stay there for ideally two, three, four, five years. Um, and you can sell it at any time. And it's not based on the cash flow. It's based on the actual property value. Yeah. So, I mean, we've bought, one of my first rentals I bought, I bought it for 20 grand. Um, we just recently sold it for 190,000. Insane. So, you know, the, the, the multiples like that is hard to come by in the, the multifam. But to argue on the other side, multifam typically has better cash flow. Mm -hmm. So I'd buy both. Yeah. And you could do the force appreciation on the multifam. Yeah. So everything we do, we try to do value add. I've only, I've only ever bought, the first, the first duplex I ever bought was the only like turnkey, like stabilized performing asset. Um, everything, everything since then uh, has basically been the Burr model. So, if you were to buy a big deal, would you do it with uh, with partners like you did initially? Yeah, it depends on the size of the deal. Um, so, we just bought like a warehouse building in Columbus. It was a six hundred and forty ish thousand dollar purchase. I saw you talk about that on TikTok. Yeah, so six forty purchase, uh, maybe a hundred thousand a rehab. It's not bad at all. And then if you run it based on the cap rate, once we get it leased out, it's currently marketed. Um, but it'll be worth like one three to one five on the back end. So something like that, all I did is raised 100% private money. Um, I'm paying them 12% interest. They have no equity in the deal. Um, so, you know, I obviously want to try and keep as much equity as possible, yeah. right? I say wealth is through ownership. So retain as much equity as you can. Uh, but on the flip, you know, we're, I'm in the process uh, with a partner of mine uh, building 108 units, um, new construction, and it's like a multi, multi, multi million dollar raise. So something like that, you know, we're definitely giving equity in the deal to get people intrigued. Um, but if you can, you know, keep the equity, you know, that yeah. that's where the real wealth comes from. Like the cash flow doesn't get you wealthy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all the other benefits of real estate. Today's video is sponsored by Great Credit Fast. Do you want to invest in real estate or possibly Airbnb? Maybe you want to start and grow a company or a business or possibly get debt free. With Great Credit, you're able to achieve all of this and much, much more. The last thing that you want to do is borrow money from a credit card company paying 25 or 27 percent interest because when you look at the real numbers and you look at what's actually happening in the economy that's the worst strategy and it's almost a guaranteed failure take a look at this so if you're borrowing ten thousand dollars at a 27 percent interest rate paying 250 bucks a month it's going to take about nine years to pay this off and about sixteen thousand dollars in wasted resources paid to one of these credit card companies however with great credit you're able to do a balance transfer in most cases and get debt free 
for 0% interest and pay this off in a fraction of the time. In 2008, banks started tightening up lending restrictions, and that's exactly what they are doing now. They're getting ready to tighten up lending restrictions, meaning that if you have that low credit score, 400, 500, 600 credit score, if you're in that even low 700s, it becomes much more challenging to get access to money. But if you look at Blackstone, for example, Blackstone, they are using their credit and their relationships to raise money. They've just raised $30 billion to invest in single family rentals. If you want to invest in real estate, you want to really grow in scale during the greatest wealth transfer of all time, you're going to need great credit to do it. We would love to give you a free consultation to see how we can help you at greatcreditfast.com. That's greatcreditfast.com or give us a call at 561 430 5,900. Now back to the show. So how are you going from 600 to a million three? Like, where's the value? Are you adding, um, are you maybe bringing in high quality tenants? Are you kind of like subdividing and making more units inside the structure? Like what's the play? So it came through foreclosure. Um, so it was, it was highly distressed. Um, and the cool thing with like commercial, what I'm learning this is my first, um, warehouse building, but when the tenants come in, the tenants sometimes will do the build out. So the rehab budget, the tenants will put in themselves sometimes. Now, sometimes the owners have to do it. It just depends what you can negotiate. Um, so part of that will be the tenants doing it. Um, the other part, I thought we would have to do all the entire parking lot, which is like 100000 just that. Um, and I got some feedback from some commercial brokers. And they're like, no, I think you're good. And I was like, well, that's nice. We can keep all that. Um, so really just came distressed, came through a foreclosure. Uh, it was vacant. There was like... Uh, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars a month in cash flow, uh, not cash flow in rent, which is terrible yeah. on a 16,000 square foot warehouse. Um, so, you know, getting it out of there, cleaning it up a little bit, a lot of it was demo and trash out and then just placing a, a tenant, you know, on a triple net lease, you know, that, uh, like, you know, on commercial, it's the values based on the revenue, right? Yep. On the NOI. So getting a, a tenant on a triple net and, you know, trying to increase the, the, the cap rate on it. Yeah. So for people that don't know, uh, people look when people are uh, investing in real estate, they'll look at gross scheduled income, then look at the expenses to come up with the net operating income and divide net operating income by purchase price to get an idea of, you know, what the return would be if they paid all cash. And then they kind of look at deals where they can, you know, buy a property at distress, they can fix it up, they could increase the cash flow. And uh, with that, their equity would grow and they make money and ideally do a cash out refi, pull their money out tax free and continue to grow. 100%. That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> what about the uh, the build up that you're doing or that build out with, uh, what is these 120 units? Uh, yeah, new construction. So it's just land right now. So we're still, you know, going through that entire process. Um, it's a, I don't know, $25, $30 million deal. So there's a lot more people involved. You know, there's developers, there's sponsors, there's LPs, there's GPs. So Are you raising that money on social? Um, I, so we're not at that point yet. Uh, we're still waiting on like all the docs and everything. Yeah. Um, but I think my partner, you know, end up doing that. Um, he's got uh, one guy that said he can bring it all. So, you know, that'd be nice. Simplify yeah. the whole process. So we'll see what turns out on that one. Yeah. That's, is that in Ohio also? Yeah. Yeah. You know, every, everything so far has been in Ohio. Is it, so you, well, like, what, what is it that you love about Ohio? Is it just mainly that you know it? Yeah. I mean, it's born and raised is one, you know, I'm from Columbus. Um, I got a lot of, I, that's where I know most of my people. Um, but also too, you know, Intel has put, just put 20 billion in, you know, they'll go up to a hundred billion, um, Google, Google or Microsoft, one of the two just bought a hundred and some acres next door to Intel. Um, you know, there's a lot of really, really big companies like fortune 500 companies moving their headquarters into Columbus, Ohio. Um, and there's another statistic, I forget the exact stats, but it's like Columbus is within a seven hour drive of 80% of the U S population yeah. or something like that. Um, so it's kind of, I don't know, some people say it's becoming like a hub of the Midwest. It makes sense. It's affordable. Yeah. And it's like close to a lot of cities yeah. with like inexpensive labor in relation to other markets. Yep. Like it's well positioned like, yeah. for growth. I, when I moved here to Florida, I came in with a mindset of like how much I had to spend to like live a life that I wanted to spend. Yeah. And it was, I way undershot it because I'm from Ohio. Yeah. You know, it, it the, the price of everything is way better in Ohio, but the lifestyle, you know, depends. Yeah, there's trade-offs for agreed, sure. For sure. What do you think is uh, the the future in 2023? We were talking about this before we started filming. Yep. Like a lot of people are looking at the market and they're like, it's either going to crash or it's going to continue to go up. Um, but if you look at fundamentals, fundamentals would have said the last couple of years, things would have probably played out differently than it did. Agreed. So what do you think the next year looks like? Yeah, man, this is the crystal ball. Um, I've, I thought it was going to crash a long time ago. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you have cash flow, the only reason a company ever goes bankrupt, and there's only one, is from lack of cash flow. Mm -hmm. Everything else, and they can, they can be running a crazy burn rate, but if they have more cash coming in, they're good. Yep. So lack of cash flow is what screws people over. So if you buy for cash flow today, and it truly cash flows on today's numbers, not projected in the future numbers, 
you know, whatever happens, you're, you're inevitably going to be okay. Um, so that's kind of the main focus I'm focusing on is the cash flow of things. Um, and I'm staying out of high end properties too. You know, I think if a, if a downturn does come, you know, high end probably it's going to get hit the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the entry level, you know, first time home buyer area is there's always going to be buyers there. So I'm hoping that stays a little bit stronger. So um, I, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I, I've seen arguments on both sides and I, I like both the arguments. Yeah. Yeah. Blackstone, uh, they raised a $30 billion fund yeah. and they're, they're targeting three things. One is data centers, hospitality, and uh, housing. Yep. And the housing it would only make more the most sense that they would go after entry level housing. Yeah. Because you're going to see people downsize, and you're going to see the bottom get bigger and more demand on that, and rents are likely going to remain strong or even grow. Whereas like Class A could probably get hit pretty hard. Agreed for sure. And I mean, it, especially in Columbus, we had a, a, every hedge fund you can imagine was buying in Columbus. You, you know, two years ago, two two minus years ago. Yeah. Um, and they've been gone, you know, ever since kind of, you know, COVID kind of went through, um, nobody's came back yet. And I'm, I'm wondering like, do they know something we don't know or why aren't they, why aren't they back buying? Right. It's probably, you know, interest rates or something. Um, but I don't know. I, I think real estate is very hard to beat as an investment asset. You think it's probably one of the easiest ways for people to make money that have no money? Um, make wholesaling. Wealth? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, Yes, you know, because you can get in wholesaling with literally no money. You can bring a deal and get equity in a deal. You know, the the warehouse I'm telling you about, the one that I just bought, the 16,000 square foot, you know, somebody brought me that deal and they have a piece of equity in it. So it's like, you can you can get that equity, you can get the ownership um, just by having amazing deal flow. And then you do that, now you have a balance sheet, now you're building some cash flow, you do that a couple of times, now you can go out and you can go do your own deals. Yeah. So for someone that has no idea what wholesaling is, how would you explain wholesaling? Yeah, so the simplest form wholesaling is you find a seller to sell your property for a hundred thousand dollars. You put in contract, and then you buy and you find an end buyer to buy that property for one hundred and ten thousand dollars. You assign your rights, so basically you remove yourself. Mm-hmm. And then the end buyer buys the property for one hundred and ten. Seller gets a hundred, and then you get the ten thousand dollar margin. So you can wholesale and make a thousand dollars. You can wholesale and make a couple hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, it just depends on the asset. Yeah, a lot of people are talking. It was like. TikTok was flooded with wholesaling the last sure. couple of years. Everyone's like, wholesale, wholesale. <laughs> a lot of people are making a lot of money. 100%. A lot of people are making a lot of money. And do you think that's probably the easiest way for people to get started? Yeah, if you're brand new and, and you don't have much money, wholesaling is 100% the way to go. You know, if you have a, a very solid stream of income today, uh, whether it's a W-2 or another business, um, you know, maybe wholesale might not be the right way. Maybe yeah. it's just, you know, buying assets, that, you know, that'll, that'll have rental properties for the future. Uh, but yeah, if, if you're young or, or old and you don't have much money, wholesaling is an amazing way to start making a lot of money. So do you fix up your uh, fix and flips the same that you do on a long-term rental? For the most part, there's a couple of slight differences. Uh, some people say like rentals are cheaper to renovate. It's actually the opposite for us. We put more money into the rentals because uh, we do what's hardening the rental properties. Because the thing that destroys you on rentals is the maintenance cost. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can keep the maintenance and turnover down, then you're going to end up making a lot more money. So one of the things that we do in flips, we do uh, hardwood in the living spaces and then carpet on the stairs and the bedrooms and the hallways, et cetera. Um, on rental properties, we do hardwood everywhere. So every part of the house is getting hardwood. Uh, LVT or LVP. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's one thing. The other, uh, we do white appliances or black um, in rentals and then stainless on flips. Um, we do granite countertops in rentals. Um, and depending on the market, we'll do Formica or granite on the flips. Um, and then the surrounds we put in the, I used to do tile, but then what happened is maintenance problems. We had to go in and patch the tile. We couldn't find the tile. We had yep. to rip down the whole uh, surround. So I would do basic subway if you're going to do tile because you can find that at any time. Uh, but for us, we just do the really thick um, uh, plastic uh, surrounds on the showers and tubs now. Um, you know, they can't punch holes in them. Uh, some of the stuff you see is crazy. Yeah. Um, so there's a few variables. But basically, we try to harden the property as much as possible. When you say we, what, is the, what does your team look like? Uh, so uh, <laughs> I have a property management company that manages all the properties. Um, I have a couple general contractors that run, you know, the projects and everything. Um, I have somebody in house, you know, that helps with like utilities and transaction coordination and stuff. Um, and then, I mean, that's, that's basically the team. And then was like, when you get deal flow, do you have people that are out there knocking doors, doing like uh, every door direct mail? Do you have like run Facebook ads? Do you have like a assistant where you bring the deal flow in? Then you have somebody that goes out there, runs comps. And then if it passes that through that stage, then it goes to admin and then and then it gets to a point to where you would actually look at it before a check's written? Yeah, so uh, past tense, yeah. I mean, we had a I had an office in Columbus when I was living there. Um, we had a ton of cold callers. We had a transaction coordinator, project manager, uh, junior acquisitions, acquisitions, sales. So we had everybody. I think we had, I don't know, seven people in the office or something. And um, 
you know, when I moved to Florida, that, you know, dissipated. And so the deal flow was, you know, RVM, SMS, direct mail, um, door knocking, cold calling, all that stuff. Um, since then, since I moved to uh, Florida, the, the deal flow is honestly just from people I built relationships with. So, you know, having the brand on social media, people send me deals every day. I um, mean, when I was in Columbus, before I left, one of the biggest things I did, and I highly recommend this to anybody in, a, in an area, but I did monthly meetups. So every month I did a free meetup. Um, I had, you know, 100 people, 100 plus people come out to those. Um, and I'll just teach them the game, you know, how to, how to uh, estimate rehabs, how to do marketing, how to uh, do sales calls, how to do dispositions, whatever it is. Um, so people would come in, learn the game, go get a deal, and they would send it to me because they, yeah. they learned from me for free. Um, so it, was, it worked amazing when I was in Columbus. And since I've left, you know, those same people are still sending me deal flow. So uh, to, short answer to your question, basically all of it comes from social media and relationships now. Interesting. What, what uh, percentage of social media or that traffic you think comes from social? Um, it's, it's hard to say because like the relationships that may have happened from social media are now relationships. So like sense. how many of those came from social? Um, I, but uh, f- more than half for sure. I would say 70, 80, 90%. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been on social? Um, I've been posting on social for five or six years, um, but taking it seriously for three or four years. Yeah, it's, I think uh, people understand the value of a personal brand, but yeah. I don't think they really understand it until they have one. I don't and even think I understand it. Like, it. It really can just, yeah, like it's a life changer. It, it, yeah, it, I think I think Hormozy said, I was listening to a podcast. No, it was Gary Vee or, or Hormozy, I forget. But when you really run it back and you think about, uh, you always want to do your highest paid task, right? The mm-hmm. one thing you make the most money from. And when you really, really think about it, arguably the highest thing that you can do to make the most money as possible is build a personal brand and make content. Yep. But I mean, I have a brand and I still don't even, you know, put that first, right? It's up there. It's in the top three or five, but it's not first, right? So I don't even think I understand the true power of what a social brand can, uh, a personal brand can do. Um, and I've reaped a lot of rewards from it and I'm, yeah. I'm still trying to understand and wrap my head around it. So I'm with you hundred percent. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, Speaking of Hermosa, he put a video out yesterday saying like how beasts would be worth, Mr. Reeves would be worth a hundred billion. Yeah. Right. And I I watched that. I'm like, I mean, the leverage that he put behind his brand to sell a mass market product with a, with very fat margins, Mm -hmm. it's uh, it could be replicatable even on a very small scale in a much higher niche market. Like if you're doing coaching or if you're doing some type of online service and you're, you know, making five, 10 grand a, a pop, you scale that out across a couple thousand people, your life's changed. 100%. I mean, look at Prime. Yeah. Like I, I've, I've heard that's a billion dollar company within a year or two, I think. And I heard like the products are like garbage in it. Like that, it's like really bad for you, but they're yeah. printing money. Like that's awesome. But it's all came from a personal brand. Yep. It's, I mean, I, there's another deal, um, came from a personal brand. It partnered with a guy on it that brought it to the table. Um, it was $2.4 million of equity in six months. So 1.2 mil was mine in six months on a deal I never would have had. Like it, it, I can give you example after example after example, you know, why making a personal brand makes so much sense. Uh, but you know, people always like, you know, well, I haven't monetized my brand. Uh, well, one, when you start a brand, you shouldn't be thinking about monetizing day one anyways, because mm-hmm. you'll screw up on that big time. But two, like it, it's so hard to quantify how you monetize the brand because that deal that came in, how do you know that came from that post that you made on TikTok six months ago or, you know, the JV or you raised private money to be able to go out and do another deal? Like, how do you quantify that that came from posting a video on social media? It's hard to do. So people want to like put out and make money. They want to see the ROI. But with social media, you don't have that visibility to see the immediate ROI. And I think that's why a lot of people don't do it and they don't value it because they, they don't see it long term. So you don't have to necessarily monetize. You don't got to get a credit card day one. But there's so many other ways you can monetize a brand. You know, doing a podcast, you're going to make a lot of money in the future, right? And it might not be necessarily from brand deals today, but you might get looped into that one business idea or that one deal or somebody needs money and you can connect them with the right person. Now you get a piece of the equity of the deal. Like that, that's where the true value comes in. Yeah, I was doing a project in LA like five years ago. And um, at the time I was like selling real estate in LA. Um, and I'm like, you know what, I'm doing this project. I'm gonna film it. I'm gonna yep. like make content around it. And I uh, found a builder and he built it off me and I was filming it. And that's how my my social media initially kind of like picked up was yep. because of that. And I was like, oh, we'll do meetups at the property. Had like people coming over. And like, interestingly enough, like just the, the content that I was filming, the courses that I sold during that, um, like uh, paid for more than the construction. 100%. So it's just like, it's unbelievable that like, uh, yeah, if you don't think about it as like a short-term game and you're like, I'm going to spend six months or a year and I'm going to put content out every single day and actually try to create value. Yeah. Like how the world will pay you back for that. And you got to stick to it. I mean, I, I think... <sighs> 
I, I think this is accurate. I'm pretty sure it is. I think I had a hundred videos on YouTube before I got monetized. And like, I'm still not, I only got like 50,000 subs on YouTube. So it's still not anywhere close to where it should be, but I have hundreds of videos now and I make maybe a few grand a month from it. Mm -hmm. But it's like, how long do you stick to it? Right. Eventually that's going to pop. And I know I've, people have seen me on YouTube that I've either came to a mastermind, paid for a coaching program, brought a deal just from a YouTube video. So again, yeah. but it's so hard to, to quantify that. Uh, but like you said, you have to, you can, it can't be like a two week thing. Like I didn't go viral. I quit. Yeah, you know this takes time. You got to put in a lot of a lot of energy and effort to to actually grow a true personal brand. Yeah, I get people all the time DM me like, "Hey, I want to get on YouTube." I'm like, "I don't think you actually do." Because yeah. if you look at how much work it actually takes to create a channel, yep. and you're spending hours a day, hundred like, percent hours a day on that channel. Yeah, and like you said, it's going to be a year before you make a penny. Probably agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Now so, I have like I have editors, and we're like I was showing Dominic uh, before. It's like if I post a video and. It doesn't get X amount of views within like five minutes. I'm like, oh, the video is gonna bomb, and like has to hit certain thresholds. Yeah. And if it, it if it exceeds it, then you're like, okay, like you're in a better mood because of it, because that hard work actually like For sure. gave a net result to the audience. Yep. And if it doesn't, then it's like a ah, the next video has to be much better. Agreed. And and if you want to build it, you got to treat it as a business too. Yeah. It, we we track KPIs. We track what's working, what's not working. We have t weekly team meetings on it. So it's like you can't just post it and not actually treat it like a business right again yeah. it's just something that's so hard to for people to understand like it is a business it can make money and you got to stick to it just like any other business yeah but it's like oh i'm just gonna post on social you know i don't know some people like a lot of people you know just put half the energy into what it needs to be so when you post do you have uh i, I saw on your website you have online courses that you're selling to and then you have like so what is like what is the the life of austin look like it's like you'd film content with projects that you're working on mm -hmm. and then you know that obviously what you're actually doing in your day-to-day -day life makes your content and your personal brand mm -hmm. and then you have that some of that will actually flow into courses and uh, other type of uh i guess is it done for you services or other services that where you're helping people or giving them personal attention yeah so i mean the, the big one is courses and coaching programs you know that, that's one of the ways we monetize it um you know for real estate investors but kind of the funnel you know sometimes we shoot specifically for content so we'll write up 10 20 30 shorts that will just shoot just for that but a lot of the other times is pulling stuff out of a YouTube video or pulling stuff out of a podcast like this. You know, you can come back and cut this up. Um, you know, just sitting in the office and having conversations with private money lenders. You know, I would, this past week I was trying to raise a lot of money. We had a heavy deal flow. So I had to tap into new people that I've never tapped into before. So I was just on the phone. So like recording those conversations, like that's the, the true organic content that a lot of people want. That's not like scripted. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it's, it's, planned other times it's just day in the life and then we cut it up and post it uh, we post on instagram tiktok um, facebook and youtube shorts and then we do long form youtube videos as well um, the long form youtube videos some of them are day in the life which can just happen day in the life um, a lot of them are pre-planned and scripted not scripted word for word but kind of like bullet pointed yeah, yeah um some of them are talking heads some of them are you know out walking a, a new property talking about you know how to renovate a house or something so um all that stuff gets posted on social they follow me we build a relationship um, they can get on an email list a text list um and then you know ideally end up buying you know a course or a coaching program or come to a mastermind um or, or something so do you would you have like a private mastermind or are you or is it kind of like a group mastermind with other people yeah, so there's kind of two products. So the Elevate Coaching is a coaching program. It's, just, it's group real estate coaching. And then there's Elevate Family, which is just like a high-level business mastermind. Um, so one's like real estate, and then one's more just business, personal brand, growth, real estate, all the above. Got it. So you just went to Europe? Uh, I did, the honeymoon. We, we went to Europe for a month. Where in Europe did you go? Uh, we went to um, Paris, Prague, uh, Rome, Florence, Venice, Amalfi, and Barcelona. Did you go cliff jumping on Amalfi? Uh, kind of. It wasn't like a real cliff. I, yeah. It may have been, I don't know, 20 feet or something. Yeah, I, yeah. I like, I don't know. I, I love the adrenaline rush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, We I went to uh, Amalfi like four or five months ago. What, and what part did you go there. to? Um, like along the coast, there's like this uh, cliff called Floydery. Okay. I mean, I'm saying it incorrectly. Yeah. There's like this big bridge um, that like the Red Bull team jumps off of. Oh, and, wow. Like, we were looking at it like, this would be freaking sick. But yeah. it was like massive and we both kind of like backed out and didn't do it. Yeah. There was like other ones around it where we're like, oh, we'll do that. But the bridge was like 80, 90 footer. And it was That's like, a big jump. It's like too much commitment. Like yeah, I'm like, kids down there, that. I'm like, I'm not going to do this. Right now. <laughs> but it's like, I knew it's possible, but it's like, yeah, I went to a, went around that area. I love being able to travel and doing those things. Are you okay. going to go back out there again? Yeah, yeah. So I think we're going to go at the end of the year. Um, I was sitting there with my wife and, uh, you know, I just saw like this old couple, like, barely 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 like walk struggling yeah. to walk 
And I was like, why, why is my parents not here? You know, it's always been my mom's dream to go to Switzerland. So uh, a couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, uh, my wife and I called her, uh, my mom and my dad. We're like, hey, we're going to Switzerland this uh, this winter. So I think we're going to go there um, a week before Christmas and then maybe go to uh, Dubai or something for the holidays. So we'll see what happens. But the cool thing, too, if like once you understand the game, so I use credit cards for everything, right? Yeah, I, yeah. Don't, I don't carry debit cards ever, period. I, I don't use them. So we use uh, credit on everything. So we run up the points. So the entire uh, honeymoon, I think it was like 25 days, um, everything, basically everything was paid for by points. All the flights, all the hotels, everything was all off of Amex points. Yeah, you hear that, Ibrahim? <laughs> I was talking to uh, my business partner, Ibrahim. Uh -huh. He's like, oh, we should cash in uh, the credit card points because you have like 400,000 points on like this Amex card. Yep. We should cash it, in, cash it in for like three grand. I'm like, the, the money doesn't matter. Yeah. You, like if you find those deals, you end up flying first class from you know where you're going to where you're going for 80% off. Yeah. Like you can really kind of leverage these points and like crush it 100%, with these points. 100%. So I, and I don't know, when I hear people that still use debit like th there's literally no point to it. now when i use credit i've never let uh, a balance ever go past the you month. always pay the statement you have to that, that's where people get caught up on it yeah so. um what are you like what is your plan going forward for for 23 and 24 are you going to like continue just uh looking to raise money and kind of build build out units and kind of just go bigger and bigger and bigger or are you going to double down on what's worked in the past yeah uh, I definitely double down on what's worked. So, I mean, we just bought the warehouse uh, like a month-ish ago, a month and a half. Um, and the more I learn about it, the more I like it. You know, triple net leases, five-year leases, you know, automatic yearly increases, two, three, four, five percent yearly increases. Um, if the taxes go up, the tenants eat that. So, I, I, the more I learn about it, the more excited I am about it. Um, so, I'm actually flying back to Ohio tomorrow to go look at another warehouse that I've been negotiating with the seller for a few weeks now. Um, try to pick that up. It's about 8,000 square feet. Um, so I'm really liking that. How much is that deal? Uh, the one tomorrow, uh, at, it's like 550, 525. So give or take, we're, we're trying to, and they're going to sell or carry it. So that we're just trying to figure out the terms to get on the same page. So that type of deal, what would be the play? Would it be to, to switch out tenants and kind of? Yeah. So that one's vacant too. They just, they sold a company and the real estate and then they defaulted and then they foreclosed and took it back. So it's it's a you know asset that's producing zero cash flow. So you can't get bank financing on it because it, it doesn't produce anything. Um, so we got to bring a down payment. I'm going to raise private money for the down payment. And then the seller is going to carry back more than half of uh, the, the purchase price as well. Um, and the plan would just be to get a tenant on a triple net lease. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, you know, at a price that, that makes it make sense and uh, just cash flow, just add it to the portfolio. Yeah. So, so like... When when you say you know it doesn't produce any income currently and you're going to fix it up and you're going to do the work, like what that actually is for a lot of people is like sure it it assumes more risk for someone that doesn't know what they're doing, mm -hmm. but also provides more opportunity for those that are willing to go out there and take that risk. When have you ever had that kind of blow up on you? Because oh, you do man. a ton of deals, not everyone's going to work out. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I've I've lost money on like actual loss money physically. Yeah like three or four deals, opportunity cost on a lot of deals, millions of dollars. Yeah. That's, those are lessons learned. Um, but I mean, one, for example, it, it was a, and I forget the exact numbers, but it was a very, you know, normal flip for us. Uh, I think it was like 150 ish purchase, maybe 50 ish on the rehab. And we thought we could sell it for like 270. So, you know, make 30, $40,000 and, and move on. Right. It's a great yeah. base, base hit. Um, but what happened was, is we undershot the rehab, right? It was one of those things like I, I wanted to do a deal. So you fudge the numbers to make it make sense on yeah. paper. So we undershot the rehab. So we put more money into it than we thought we could. And then we overshot the ARV and it sold for significantly less than what we thought we could. And instead of holding it for three months, we held it for 12 months. So every way imaginable that that margin pinched. Um, I think we ended up losing 30 or $35,000 on it. Um, so that was not a fun feeling. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's not uh, a ton of money, but yeah, it's definitely sucks to, to work all that. For sure. And so put all that effort in. But yeah, I mean, every time I've... Every time I've lost money, one, I wasn't honest on the numbers on the front end, and two, it's always been a property that's been like halfway renovated, and I budgeted to kind of pick up where they stopped and finish, but then what happens is, you know, you get in there, you start seeing things, and you have to go back and do more work, so the rehab budget always goes over. So I was like, yo, I'm, I'm not buying halfway done projects anymore. Like, it needs to be done, or it needs to be not started. Because anywhere in between, like, did they pull a permit? Did they run the electric right? Does the electric wires even work? Or were they from two years ago? It, it, it's It's been a nightmare every time. So one thing that's kind of, like, messed with me, and I'm wondering, like, your your take on this, like, 2018, 2019, it's like you could underwrite the deal based, you know, on the numbers, and you could kind of put your spread into it. Mm -hmm. But now, given that, like, 
the world's just not the same that it was back then. Yep. And so, like, do you apply a certain margin of safety because of that? Like, you look at what happened with, we were talking about this before we started recording, like, how do mortgage rates basically triple yeah. and home values stay the same? Like, it, I've never seen that. No, 100%. It, um, there was a time for six or nine months, I think everybody experienced it, but, like, everything froze. And mm -hmm. it was like, oh, gosh, like, what, what's about to happen here? Um, and then back in Ohio, for at least uh, the, about three, four, five months ago, you know, it picked up like COVID. Yeah. And I mean, people are multiple offers, multiple showings, you know, offers over ask, appraisal gap coverages, the same stuff we used to see that caused this problem in the first place, like right back to that. Um, so to answer your question, what am I doing on the purchase? Um, I'm not doing high end projects because it's just, you know, if you're off 5% on a high end deal, it's a lot more money. Um, so staying out of that. And then I'm also staying out of like heavy, heavy re renovations. So when I first got into the game, I didn't do a rehab for the, I don't know, first three years for less than $100,000 in construction. I'm not doing any of those anymore. Again, just more variables, more unknown, more budget issues, more timeline issues, more market issues. So no high end, no high renovation. Um, we're basically staying in the entry level uh, home buyer market. So, you know, we're buying for 100 to 200 grand, putting 30 to $60,000 into them, renting out in a month or two. Um, and then ideally burr it out and refi it. Um, but I used to like buy deals at, you know, 10, 11, 12% profit margins. Um, now we want to, we, I'm sticking pretty hard to the 15% plus profit margins, um, just to have a little bit more cushion, you know, in case something does happen. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Are you doing, are you going to consider uh, lending on like distressed assets as well? Cause there's probably going to be a lot of people that are, uh, you know, maybe they put too much into the deal or maybe they're. Like this is something that I'm looking at as well. Like the forty percent of all mortgages are taken out between twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one with the average down payment of ten percent. Yep. And so like people basically have the golden handcuffs right now. Yeah. Like they, they got a great rate, but you know, the average person stays in their home for eight years. And yeah. nowadays people they can't stay still for even five years. Agreed. So you're gonna have all these people that are gonna probably wanna do something and not be able to. So, yeah, so that, that goes into the subject two thing, you yeah. know, buying it with keeping the interest rate in place. Um, you know, I think with that, most people aren't going to walk away with nothing. And typically you have to make up back payments. Yeah. So you have to come with something to the table, whether that's five, ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. So I think where the opportunity like that comes into play, we just did one. It was a, like 70000 sub two. They were on year 14 of their 30-year mortgage, which is amazing because yeah. we're paying down principal. But we had to raise 80000 uh, for the the back owed mortgages, um, the what they wanted to walk with, and what the wholesaler wanted to walk with, so I didn't want to come eighty thousand out of pocket for a single family, you know, two hundred thousand dollar house. So we just went to a private money lender, raised it uh, seven or eight percent, uh, put a three year note on it, and we're just paying interest only payments. So nice. you know, as you as more of those come up, you know, raising it's it's very easy to raise ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. It's yeah. harder to raise two hundred, three hundred, five hundred grand. So if you can get these opportunities where you only need to raise ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, you know a lot of people have that type of money, and a lot of people want to be in real estate. So that can kind of be their way to get into real estate. So I definitely think more of those opportunities are coming. Yeah, I mean, basically everybody has twenty grand. Yeah, they're, they could find it. They're they're close to somebody that has twenty, thirty, fifty grand. Hundred percent. You work at a gas station, got twenty grand almost. Yeah, I mean, I so I sent out an email when I went on that raising because we had an influx in deal flow. Um, I sent out an email to my list, and it was basically something along the lines of like, "Hey, you know, I got this opportunity. If you're interested, hit me up." Um, more storyline to it, uh, but we got a ton of messages back. Um, and probably 70, 80% of them had sub $50,000 to lend. And really for me, the only way those types of uh, money dollar amounts can get into deals is things that we're talking about, like subject to gap funding. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, they can't fund a $200,000 deal. So, you know, it's hard for me to place 10 to 50 grand um, on a deal because there's just not many opportunities like that. But hopefully more of those will come. Uh, but it also goes back to like digging your well before you're thirsty. You yeah. know, when, when you need money, it's very hard to raise money. Yeah. You know, I, I did that a few weeks ago, got everything raised and got more deal influx um, basically these la this week. And it was a lot easier to raise this money because I already had these conversations two weeks ago. Yeah. So it's just building the relationships continuously. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely like I feel like the next year or two years is going to be a huge opportunity for a lot of people to make a lot of money if they for position sure. themselves in the right relationships and they have like their – their plan kind of locked in. Yeah. Well, uh, it seems like you're kind of like doubling down more on the, like you went from flips to, you know, your obviously long-term rentals, burst strategy to now kind of leaning more into uh, uh, triple net leases 
and commercial? Yeah, go, going through that transition right now. So um, I mean, we're, we're heavily buying single family property still. We're buying one a week, two a week, um, just the you know regular everyday type of burrs. So very much heavily buying those. Um, and very intrigued on the the triple net stuff. So you know, hopefully this other building works out, and then you know maybe set up marketing campaigns to uh, when I, when we were doing the marketing and the wholesaling, we we're just marketing directly to homeowners. You know, maybe spend that and start you know marketing to warehouse owners. You know, I, I don't know, but um, I just love the triple net side. Yeah. So are you also considering Section Eight? Have you done that in the past, or yeah. do you like? We have. I don't know. We probably have five Section Eight tenants. I'm I'm not opposed to it. Uh, you know, I, I don't really care one way or the other. Um, you know, six, one, half a dozen of the other. Yeah. The section, do they generally stay longer? Is uh, historically the trend? They stay longer, but they are a little bit more rough on the property. That's the argument. Uh, again, I'm, I've, I have very few, but uh, one specifically I'm thinking about, I think we bought the house three years ago. Um, and they've been there for three, they were there before we bought it and they've been there for three years since we bought it. So, um, hopefully they stay forever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were kind of talking before we started filming, like, Looking at the uh, Florida real estate market, I coming from LA and mm-hmm. investing there, it's it blows my mind about how how deals are underwritten here. Like people buying three caps, like three and a half caps, four caps, knowing that you know insurance is likely going to continue to rise and rents. They're they're basing these three or four caps based on rents climbing. You know, they having just climbed thirty five percent or whatever it may be in the last eighteen months. It's Literally. like if they give up even ten percent or eight percent of that rent growth. Like you're done. How does it make sense? You're done. You know, I, I was telling you before we started, I got sent a 20 unit here in Florida and I ran the numbers and uh, I was like, guys, you, you, you will 100% lose $30,000 a year minimum on this deal. Like, how does this even make sense? And they're like, well, we already got a cash offer. I was like, this is nuts. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know. I would not buy in Florida unless it was some crazy smoking deal uh, because the cash flow doesn't make sense. And like you said, what I'm learning from being here is the insurance is crazy yeah and it just keeps going up and up and, and a lot of places you can't even get insured yeah it's, yeah there's a uh glenn kelman ceo of redfin he came mm-hmm. out in like 2020 and put out this article saying that in florida it's going to get a lot harder to get financing and insurance i believe i was like it. talking about that on youtube back then everyone's like ah, i just sell him fear i'm like well, that's what he's saying and i would bet he probably has access to good information yeah and like it's slowly been the case it's like things are just getting more and more expensive 100%. so like i do love florida and i would love to invest here but hopefully we see kind of like a, a repricing of assets with some opportunity there. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hope so too. But uh, I mean, you think Florida, like Florida is very desirable. Everybody wants to live here. Yeah. So you get the cream of the crop from everywhere else to go come to South Florida. So, I mean, there's so much money down here. You know, that, that was, a, I think it was two and a half, I don't know, four million. I forget what it was, but cash offer. Like everything's cash down here. And, you know, it's hard for prices to, to drop heavily when you got that much cash sitting around. Yeah. Yeah, and 17% or 16.8%, something like that, of Florida homes sit vacant. Just retirees that just bought properties. Or and like, snowbirds. <laughs> I had no idea that there was that many houses. Out of 100 houses, almost 17 are vacant. That's crazy. Of people just like, you know, have a house here in Florida. That, I didn't know like, that either. Yeah, it's like there's a, just so much freaking money here. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't I don't think we're probably going to see like something big here. But uh, if that does happen, I would love to kind of pick up some stuff here. Are 100%. you going to... Um, potentially invest overseas or have you thought about doing anything like that? Um, it's crossed my mind, but uh, again, what you don't know, maybe if I meet somebody that, you know, is already operating it at a high level and I can add value somehow, uh, maybe, but uh, as of right now, there's nothing, nothing in the near future. You I mean more of like buying a second home or buying like a location to where you kind of like spend some time at? I don't think so. Uh, like the argument is like get an Airbnb where you can split time there, but it's like, I don't want to go to the same place twice. Yeah. I, w- I want to keep going to a new place. Yeah. So I don't know. I Probably not. How yeah. about you? I feel like you got the itch. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people that are like, just over the last couple of years, now being more of a, like approaching the world from more of a global mindset. Yeah. Because, you know, people don't know um, what's going to be, you know, the best thing in five years or 10 yeah. years. So you're seeing people, I have friends in LA that went and bought places in Mexico. I have friends that bought places in Costa Rica, friends yeah. that are looking at Portugal, looking at citizenship there, yeah. friends that moved to Puerto Rico. Uh, which is obviously still market, but people are just like exploring outside of, um, you know, where they where they formerly were. Yeah. And so maybe it would be something that I would consider in the near future. I went to look at a property in Mexico. Yeah. Like six weeks ago, um, on the tip of Mexico, like not that far from Cancun, but I wasn't that uh, I wasn't that excited about it. We didn't end up buying it. Yeah. But um, came back. But it's definitely something that I'd consider. I mean, I. 
Agreed. Nobody knows where the United States is going to be in a few years. So I, I wouldn't be opposed to it if the right opportunity came up. Yeah. What online businesses do you like right now? Um, Speaking of like having kind of a global mindset, if it's not just, are you 100% going full in real estate or are you also kind of doing other, uh, I think I saw something like affiliate marketing or something you're doing? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's three things. One, trying to buy as much real estate as possible. Um, there's just so many benefits from it. Um, two is continue to build the personal brand. You know, I, I know that'll continue to drive revenue in the future. Um, and then three is the ERC, the employee retention credit. Um, I've been doing that for like two-ish years. What is, uh, tell me more about that. Because I think I had some guy... Um, pitch me to try to sign up for something like that on YouTube. Yeah. But you get a bunch of these emails, you don't read half of them. Yep. What is, what is this? So uh, what is it? It's called the Employee Retention Credit. Business owners that were open during 2020 and 2021, which had certain parameters, um, can qualify for a credit of $26,000 per employee that they never have to pay back. So, you know, there's business owners with 10, 20 employees getting a quarter million dollars of a check from the IRS that they never have to pay back. So, you know, it's a huge opportunity. But in the opportunity, like, for where, where I come into play uh, we just basically help facilitate that. We help the business owners get access to the funds, and then we just take a fee on it. So that can be done anywhere. You know, it can be done through cold calling. It can be done through emailing, text blasting, um, and it's it's an affiliate opportunity. So there's companies that process these things, and then they pay affiliates to bring business to them. Um, so I love that. I mean, it's one of the biggest money grabs I've ever seen in my lifetime, and the plan is to make a lot of money and go buy more real estate. Well, how like when you say one of the biggest money grabs, like you don't have to give your specific numbers, but hypothetically. Um, how much could somebody make with a halfway decent following? I mean, closing a, a deal a month, you could probably do a hundred thousand this year, and it's it's not difficult. To, you're, you're, the sell is you're selling money that you never have to pay back, so it's it's an incredible opportunity for sure. So, like, who's the perfect target customer for that? Is it a small business owner that has like Z- one to five hundred employees fit the box? So, I mean, it's basically every business owner out there. That's they, not, so, like. I'm confused. So, like, let's say, for example, you got Sally's Deli across the way. Mm-hmm. She's got five employees. Yep. How does her payout work? So, it's based on the quarters and based on the pay, which quarters they qualify. So, there's six quarters that people can qualify for. And uh, the impact is they had to have a reduction in revenue or a government uh, shutdown order or a supply chain disruption, which basically covers the majority of businesses. They only have to have one of those. And then if they were impacted that way, they fill out a questionnaire and they see which quarters they were eligible for. And then they basically run their payroll against those quarters to determine the amount of the credit. So there's different uh, dollar amounts for different portions of all that. Um, so you can get anywhere, you can get up to 26000 per W-2 employee. Interesting. So I own a credit repair company. Yeah. Um, and we deal with so many clients that yeah. have had businesses that have like been greatly impacted yeah. because of what happened the last couple of years. Yeah. They heard like horror stories, people owning gyms, people owning trucking, people owning restaurants. Yeah. And it's just like you hear one story after the next and it's like, it's interesting that there could be a solution like that that could actually yeah, I mean, that, help a lot of these people. That could be a huge opportunity. And I, that's the only, it's the only business I've ever seen that's literally a win-win-win for everybody. Business owner gets money they never have to pay back. The company that does it gets paid. You get paid. Like nobody loses. In real estate, typically somebody's losing. You're buying yeah. a house at a discount, right? You're, yeah. you're, you're taking some equity, right? But that's business. Yeah. But it's the only it's the only business I've ever seen that's like truly a win win win. So when they sign that, was it's like a, it's a contract from the government, right? Or it's a contract that the government obviously agrees to pay. But like, there's no there's no type of like loophole at all where they would like the business owner could get stiffed or have any type of like tax liability or anything down the road. It's I mean, just like get, free money. You can always get audited. Um, so I mean, like as long as you actually don't lie, you know, there's always an audit possibility. Um, you do have to uh, basically. Uh, and I'm not a CPA, but you do have to count that money as you have to offset the write off of the expense when you get that money back. So there will be some tax. I mean, depending on your financial situation, but you know there is a possibility of taxes. But again, you're you're getting the money to pay the taxes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like if you're gonna complain about getting six, you get a dollar and you keep sixty cents. Yeah. You still get sixty cents. Exactly. Yeah. So you, how'd you get linked into that? Um, so I'm in a mastermind, and uh, one of the guys in the mastermind started one of these companies, and we were there just talking, and he was telling me about the opportunity, and it really didn't set in at first, um, kind of, and I did a webinar just from social media, you know, hey, if you're a business owner, jump on, um, did the webinar, made a few hundred thousand dollars, and I was like, oh, well, That's this insane. is insane. This is real. Um, off of like TikTok, like story, like just all of it, like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. So you just did a Zoom, had everyone show up. You click the link if you, yeah. um, if you fit X Y Z, yep. And then they would just sign up. And what's the closing process like? Uh, start to finish, like thirty days. Um, uh, 
so in a perfect world, if people go through and upload all the docs, do everything day one, you know, it usually takes a week or two to file, but from filing to payout takes anywhere from four to 12 months. It just depends on when the IRS decides to mail the checks. Got it. So that that's the only catch is just the timing. You know, you, you have to, you have to wait four to 12 months to get paid. Got it. And what does the cost look like to actually establish one of these companies? I mean, you can go next door and knock on the door and tell somebody and you can get paid for it. I mean, do you have to get any type of license or anything? You're just like, no. Nope. That's insane. It's, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. I've Yeah. Because when some guy sent me an email, I was like, oh, I'm like, ah, I don't know. You know, it's like because you get all these emails and it's yeah. like, it is actually. That, that's the hardest legit. thing like, to overcome. People think it's a scam. I'm yeah. like, it's, here's the IRS code, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a great opportunity. Um, it's around till I think, April 2025, um, I think. And, you know, we're just trying to make as much money in between there as possible. Hell and yeah. Take that money and go buy more real estate. So it's just, that's basically it, 33, 33, 33, basically, percent. Yeah. Uh, real estate. Personal uh, brand. Courses, personal brand. Yeah, and then the ERC. That's awesome, man. Well, cool, dude. Thanks a lot for coming on. You gave me a lot of uh, a lot to think about. And I think what you're doing is incredible. You're crushing on TikTok, crushing on uh, Instagram and YouTube, and a bright future ahead, man. I appreciate it, brother. It was a great time.